Thank you and good morning. It's great to be with you on a topic that oftentimes we don't want to talk about, but something we have to talk about. And as I talk about it, I oftentimes have to take, take a couple deep breaths and calm down. There was a case that uh, occurred in Pittsburgh a little over a year ago. Uh, the young man showed up at school with steak knives and began to stab his classmates. And of course, the media did the usual thing of saying he must have been bullying, but this week I read the letter he had actually written that left in his locker. It was a very rambling, psychotic type of letter about seeing himself as a god and, and the Columbine killers as gods as well and what he had to do to save the planet, etc. What was interesting there is, uh, if it had not been for a local hospital who was having special emergency drills that day and all their top surgeons were in, probably many of those students would have died. Huge lacerations to major blood vessels, liver, etc. They were able to be taken care of. You can imagine the scene in that emergency room and in the operating rooms as doctors moved quickly. Uh, some doctors, even uh, as I was told, even the operating room, <coughs> arguing so much, uh, pushing each other's way, no, we're going to do it this way. There was no time for discussion, no time for niceness, but uh, just focusing on saving lives. That being the case, let me tell you some statistics. Just in the time that I've been talking since I walked into the podium, two people tried to commit suicide in this country. 1.2 million suicide attempts serious enough to require medical care. 41,000 suicide deaths in this country this year. 43,000 drug overdose deaths. About 1,500 homicides by some with mental illness. And an unknown number, but probably at least a couple thousand, maybe more, maybe 5,000 or so, people who died that slow motion death of serious mental illness because they have so many other chronic illnesses like diabetes, heart disease, lung disease, infections or those who uh, die on the park bench or the subway grave, which is their home. And you add those numbers up, this year, we will have more people die from mental illness and its complications than the total combat deaths of Korea and Vietnam, and probably also Afghanistan and Iraq. So I hope you understand my impatience as we have introduced this bill after about 20 different hearings and forums as I've traveled around to different states, as I've talked to so many parents who have told me the tragedies they have had with their sons and daughters, or people with their mothers and fathers or brothers and sisters or spouses, or the many funerals I've gone to and perhaps some of you have gone to too. If you have a person in your family who has serious mental illness, you know what I'm talking about. If you don't, I suggest you talk, and within a few short minutes you'll find someone who can tell you these stories. And that is that um, we can't tolerate this anymore. The headlines that hit us about Oregon or this bloody summer of 2015 of Dallas and Houston and Chattanooga and Charlotte, uh, that list goes on, was an ugly summer. But it ought to tell us that something is broken in this system. And indeed it is. What our investigations told us was that, I was amazed at this, 112 federal programs deal with mental illness. 112, 24, 26 homeless programs alone. And while we are spending all this money, about 130 billion a year, the vast majority of that in disability payments, by comparison, we have seen mortality rates in the last 10 years decline for heart disease, decline for stroke, decline for AIDS, decline for auto accidents, suicides went up, drug overdose deaths went up. Something is wrong in what we were doing here. And what our subcommittee found, the oversight investigation over the last couple years, has been an amazing amount of problems. Those 112 federal programs, they haven't met since 2009 to coordinate their services. The grant programs, according to a GAO report, said they don't even ask for accountability. They don't even ask for data when somebody gets the money. What did you do? How did you spend it? Did you have results? We do know that what has come out of the lead federal organization on this SAMHSA is a kind of grant that they fund have been for, for example, uh, workshops to tell people how to get off their medication, uh, workshops on how to make collages or masks to describe their feelings, suggestions at a yoga class or drinking a fruit smoothie with your, when you're stressed, a website that went up last winter to help the people in Boston deal with snow anxiety, they had a one to know what to call $22,500 spent on a painting, 
of two people sitting on a rock, surrounded by other people sitting on a rock for mental health awareness. Um, and something like $426,000 spent on a website of animated characters doing sing-along songs for three-year-olds to help with self-esteem. But in the 40,000 word document describing this organization, not once did they mention the word schizophrenia or bipolar. And when they say evidence-based grants, evidence is it's wherever you want it to be. We also found federal programs that discriminate against those with low income. Actually, not only do we have a broken system that is neglectful and abusive towards those with serious mental illness, it is worse for minorities and low income. Medicaid has a rule, you can't see two doctors in the same day. So if a parent brings a teenager and says, my son, my daughter, the grades are going down, becoming socially isolated, he lives in their room all the time, and really into dark video games, and the, the pediatrician says, let's get them to see a psychiatrist immediately in our practice. They can't do it if they're on Medicaid. Or if someone is in the midst of a psychotic breakdown, a breakdown, a schizophrenic crisis, they're brought to the emergency room, usually by the police, and they said, we don't have any beds. Why? Because the federal program says you can't have more than 16 beds in a psychiatric hospital for people ages 22 to 64. <clears throat> now look at those last two examples I gave that deal with that adolescent young adult. Here's the problem with that. <clears throat> a severe psychiatric illness emerges in 50% of the cases by age 14 and 75% by age 24. So the very time when the vulnerability is the highest, and the diagnosis of these things are emerging is when federal programs drop off. School programs stop at age 18. The HIPAA laws change at age 18. Now, so in Medicaid's zeal to save money, it would be akin to this. Let's not have prenatal care for women ages 17 to 45. Well, you think that's absurd. That's when women have babies, right? Well, at these ages, it's the vulnerable time for severe mental illness when our government drops off services. What this bill, H.R. 2646, is a culmination. We didn't go into this and say, let's write a bill and have hearings that fit the bill. We said, let's just listen. And then when we realize the severity of these problems and the death toll, not just the death toll, there's a huge cost on, on the system for medical care uh, and, the, and the huge strain upon families. We knew we had to do something. And so this bill, in a nutshell, that revises the organization, the federal government, by having the assistant secretary of mental health and substance abuse appointed within the SAMHSA budget, no new money there, just elevate that agency from a low level agency to higher level. No more money spent. Well, I want someone with muscle who can call these 112 organizations together and says, we're going to meet and we're going to make this better. We change federal policy, we lift that same day doctor rule, we lift the, the um, 16 bed rule. We work here to get more. Uh, psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, peer support counselors, because we realized there was a dire shortage in all those areas. What I mentioned before about adolescents and, and uh, young adults, one of the greatest shortages in child and adolescent psychiatrists. We have 9,000 in the country, we need 30,000. And many of those, quite frankly, don't even work with severe mentally ill. We uh, also work to uh, have more minority providers there. Uh, among minorities, I think about two or three percent are black four or five percent are, are Latino, and it's almost non-existent to have someone who is Native American. By the way, in some Native American tribal lands in this country, the suicide rate is five to eight times that of the rest of the population. So when I talk to our colleague, Christy Nome, she says on some reservations, young girls will make pacts with each other, that one will kill herself and the others will follow. These tragedies go on. When we don't have enough, another part of our bill is how to tell a psychiatrist. So psychiatrists indeed can communicate and be part of this in the doctor's office um, throughout the nation. So we have this. Our goal is to save lives and improve those quality of lives. We also have in here revisions for the grant programs. They will. We, we have this panel, the National Policy Laboratory, made up of uh, smart minds in the field, and they will help direct how grants uh, and policies and, uh, uh, and priorities are made in this. To not focus on behavioral wellness and happiness, but to work on directed primary prevention of problems, but more into what's called secondary prevention, that is people who are now in a targeted um, uh, high-risk group, and then tertiary prevention, those who are already showing symptoms. So we're, instead of having the curve shift towards wellness, it, it shifts towards secondary and tertiary, but we still we all have prevention across the spectrum. 
it is comprehensive. It has been called the most comprehensive bill, at least in the last 50 years, but perhaps in our nation's history in, in dealing with mental illness. And it comes down to this. We know that when you identify and treat someone with serious mental illness early on, it makes a world of difference. Low level medication, proper counseling, proper educational support, et cetera, you can make a world of difference. When we continue to put that off, that according to many laws, it says we can't force anybody to do things until they uh, have, are in imminent danger of killing themselves or someone else. Imagine if we applied that standard to any other area of medicine. You have chest pains and you are kind of fading out here, but until you really have that heart attack, we're not going to treat your problem. Can you imagine how we would do that? Yes, you kind of appear diabetic, but you're not in diabetic shock yet, so we're not going to bring you into the emergency room. This is the way this system works. I wanted to mention one other area that is critical in this bill. We heard time and time again from family members that says, we want to help. We have a relative. We have uh, someone else that they were caregiver for. We want to help. Because when this person, in the midst of their delusions and hallucinations, oftentimes doesn't even know that they're ill. That's one of the natures of severe mental illness. About 40% of people have something called anosognosia. They are not aware of their own illness. They believe they are their hallucinations. And so they don't take care of themselves. Uh, and many times they have accompanying chronic illnesses, heart disease, lung disease, diabetes, and the medication they take may also increase the risk <coughs> for cardiovascular disease, diabetes, etc. We want a something in HIPAA that allows compassionate communication at times. It doesn't require a court order, doesn't, uh, but, but, but can allow a doctor in limited circumstances to, to at least provide that information to a family to say, look, your son, your father, is pre-diabetic. He's heading the wrong direction. He's picking up weight, other things. He really needs to see an endocrinologist. I'm not going to tell you the therapy notes. I can tell you what to talk about from saying this needs to be done. Or is it's picked up because they are diabetic, has an infection in their leg. They need to see someone that could turn gangrene, that could get an amputation. Or, or whatever those things are, though right now the laws do not allow that compassionate communication. And what we say is actually the bar is pretty high, or we say the keyhole is pretty small. But to say with a known caregiver and a licensed provider, when that person has diminished capacity to understand their own illness and do anything about it, uh, and they would become gravely disabled or worse if they're not getting help, then that provider would be able to give a known caregiver information, which is diagnosis, treatment plan, time and place of appointment, doctor's name and contact information, and the medication. May, not shall, but whatever is necessary at that point to help that person. Now, that being the case, there's people who don't even want that done. They claim that the current system works. And I say, you know, talk to the many families we have seen. Uh, we, we have heard this over and over in our hearings, and the families say, we can't do that. And quite frankly, hospitals tell uh, doctors, you know, please don't do that, we're going to get sued. So we do need that compassionate communication clause in here to allow that to happen. Um, when some say, you know, it's the camel's nose under the tent, I say, look, we're not talking about camels here, we're talking about people who are going to die, people who are going to get sick. It is. And the unnecessary it is ambitious. But once again, on Capitol Hill, politics gets in the way. Um, for whatever reasons they are, even though I practiced psychology for 40 years, I'm not so good at mind reading, I can only really guess. <laughs> but at this point, I want us to come together. Uh, although people are saying we're not meeting with anybody, or our, my appointment schedule and my staff is constantly meeting with people for the last couple of years, and I'm sure the members of Congress have heard a lot from constituents as well. We took the first bill, we made a lot of revisions based upon that. More revisions ready, we'll work on these things, we'll make them happen. But it comes down to with 23 professional organizations supporting the bill, with at least 45 newspapers across the country endorsing the bill from the Wall Street Journal, the National Review, the San Francisco Chronicle, and the Seattle Times. I'm not sure you can get much different than some of those. To 154 co sponsors, 40 plus Democrats and 13 Republicans. This is clearly a well-supported and very diverse bill. By the way, if you look at the spectrum of members of Congress, it really goes from the founder of the Progressive Caucus to members of uh, the Freedom Caucus and RSC. I mean, this is the political spectrum. Why? Because this is an apolitical bill. In the 40 years I have practiced, I have never once asked any of my patients what party you belong to or what are your principles. I don't care. I want to make them well. And so in this, instead of us getting caught up in the idea of the right of that person to be sick, this bill focuses on the right of that person to be well. Next Wednesday, it's just announced we're going to mark up on this. Uh, God willing, the creeks don't rise. Uh, uh, we recognize.
guys. We've got a lot of work to do between now and then, and uh, we got to make this happen. Too many lives to pay. Thank you. Uh, two great colleagues, uh, Dr. Bouchon and uh, Susan Brooks, um, are, are just awesome in the committee, and that's how I best know them. Uh, when you're in oversight investigation and, or you're in energy and commerce, uh, you don't want to face these two because they do their homework and they know their stuff. Uh, well, you don't want to face them if you're going to try and pull some bullets. Uh, I might just say that because they hone in. Um, and I should say when we when we have our hearings and whether it's been General Motors or Ebola uh, last year or a Volkswagen or dealing with issues with uh, with the Affordable Care Act, so these are two brilliant minds. I'm humbled and, uh, and honored to serve with them. So that's all for the end. Ladies first. Oh. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm Susan Brooks. I represent Indiana's fifth district, which is Indianapolis <coughs> and to the north. Do you want us to just chat now, or are we going to? Yes, we'll go into things. How do you want to chat? Talk yeah. about the bill. And Each one of you can give, you know, tell a little bit about what you're doing on the subcommittee, and then okay. we'll open it up for Q and A. And it, it's this is kind of like the view, if you will. So you guys <laughs> can just say, interject that. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, so very briefly. Um, my experience and why I'm so thrilled about uh, Tim's bill, and let me just tell you, I'm in my second term, and every time, almost every time, Dr. Tim Murphy has opened his mouth in conference, it has been about this mental health bill. He has been passionate about it from the time I arrived in January of 13, and um, he is the only psychologist in the House or the Senate, I believe. We need yeah. more, I think. We absolutely need more. And sometimes he gives us therapy sessions in conference, or he tries to. Um, but I have been just so impressed with um, his tenacity on this bill and the breadth of this bill. And just very, very briefly, my background, very different from most members of Congress, is in the criminal justice system. And I've been an attorney for 30 years. And in my first 13 years of practice, I was a criminal defense attorney. Most people introduced me as a former U.S. attorney, but honestly, my, um, my involvement and passion about this issue stems around the fact that I represented individuals. I was a private criminal defense attorney, so I represented our family members, people who could afford to hire a private attorney to represent their family member in a criminal court. And I've been in many jails and prisons and the courts, and they are filled with people with mental illness. Our jails are, are actually like mental health institutions in many ways, and they're not, people are not getting the help that they need. And so that is where people end up when they don't get the critical help that they need and that their families can't give them. And so I, um, and then additionally, whether it's mental illness or substance abuse, that is often what leads people into the criminal justice system. And so that's why I've uh, held prescriber, or I've held round tables with mental health professionals, and I know we will graduate from IU, Med Set, IU Medical School, maybe 350 students in a year, and maybe three will go into psychiatry. Think about that, three out of 300. And so we have a huge need for behavioral health and for mental health professionals, and we don't have enough providers, we don't have enough beds, we don't have enough um, treatment, and so that's why I love what Tim is doing, is shining a light on this need, and uh, really hoping to get us across the finish line next week at ENC. So I think with that, Larry. All right, thank you. Uh, I was a cardiovascular and thoracic surgeon before I came to Congress, and so I have a healthcare background. Even though I uh, didn't treat uh, uh, mental illness specifically, Many of my patients uh, had no mental illness problems, but, but I've been touched personally by mental illness in a number of ways. I've had, uh, I had a young man who was a couple years younger than me in high school who I played a lot of basketball with, even up into college, who uh, unfortunately hung himself at college uh, after going home from Christmas break unexpectedly. Turns out, uh, we didn't know, but turns out he'd had some problems with uh, depression and his teen years that uh, we didn't know about as his friends. I had a high school classmate, similar, similar thing happened to him. Uh, and uh, he committed suicide in his mid-20s after a relationship fell apart, but he'd had pre-existing problems. And then, uh, believe it or not, the, the young lady who I went to uh, prom with when I was a freshman, I went to, uh, in, in, my, in my class, oh yeah, well, they, they let us, we were at a small school, they let every class go. 
Uh, she graduated from uh, high school, uh, was married in her early 20s, had two young children, and about age 25 or 26, uh, had, had schizophrenia um, uh, diagnosed, and subsequently ended up on the street. Uh, her family was lost. Her husband changed their names, moved to another state, and uh, she has since been in and out of uh, mental institutions and literally on the street for the last uh, 30 years. So I'm, I'm also passionate about this issue and I see that uh, the things that Tim is doing are, are really important. And uh, you know, we, we need to get past the fact that many people, and I mentioned this to Jim before, many people think that, well, just talk to people and you can talk them out of it. You know, they're depressed and you can just say, you know how they used to say, well, just snap out of it, you know. Pull up your bootstraps and do all that. Well, you can't do that when you have serious uh, depression problems without uh, assistance. Uh, or reason with people. People that have, say, they're in a manic phase of being bipolar or they're schizophrenic. You know, people that don't understand male illness to say, well, just talk to them and, and try to straighten that out. I mean, how many times do you, you hear that from, from people? Well, you can't do that. And so uh, I think the, the education process, getting people to understand uh, that the, it's just like having appendicitis. It, it's a mental, it's, it's a, it happens to be a mental illness, but it's just like having appendicitis. You certainly wouldn't just ignore appendicitis. You treat it with surgery. So you have to treat these diseases uh, uh, properly. And uh, the other thing we need to try to get past is the stigma and, uh, of, of it. Not only, uh, honestly, in public, but amongst healthcare providers themselves and get healthcare providers uh, involved uh, more in, uh, in referring their patients uh, to uh, medical professionals like Tim who understand uh, how to treat mental illness. So with that, thanks for having me. You Thank you all very much. Jamie, um, you did such a great job with your introduction. I will let you either have the first question or the last. Wow, I'll have the first. That's nice. Thank you, Jim. Um, you guys mentioned the stigma and the challenges you're working on legislation. What do you think the biggest hurdle is to moving this issue forward? Is it really the perception issue? Is it money for the budget? What is the biggest hurdle and how do you think you can tackle that number one challenge? Well, I, I think um, the, the issue of personal stigma, much of that is because it is so hard for people to get services. And the services they get, quite frankly, if you ever go to a community behavioral health center, it doesn't look very nice. These are their end of the budget. Um, people are struggling, uh, and uh, you, you go to a place like a uh, you know, cancer treatment center or a heart treatment center, they're beautiful buildings. I mean, they're gorgeous. They'll build them you know, to entice surgeons to build another operating room. Uh, they do wonderful things for people, and people know they're getting special care. In the area, area of behavioral health, is oftentimes pushed somewhere else. Medical records, behavioral health, and physical health are kept separate. Uh, it's treated as uh, the bastard child. And a point that Dr. Dr. Sean made is a lot of providers it's, it themselves are part of this. In the area of heart disease, high uh, probability, I'm sure you know this, people well, well, get depression. You give them that diagnosis, the depression goes off the charts. Untreated depression doubles health care costs. A lot of neurochemical complications we don't fully understand that actually makes people worse. And even a person with heart with uh, depression who doesn't have heart disease yet becomes high risk for that. So we've got to hone in on that. On the political part there, uh, there are groups that recognize for the first time they're going to be under the microscope and they have to have evidence-based numbers. they got to report back to Congress on a regular basis. This is what we're doing. This is working and this is what we're doing with your money. They have not had any accountability. That's not me. That's the General Accounting Office saying there has not been accountability for that. And some of them are scared. And then there's some people who for years have been part of closing down the institutions, and I get that, but they did exactly what Susan Brooks said. We have closed on the hospital beds and we replaced them with prisons. The largest psychiatric facilities in this country are the Cook County Jail, the Los Angeles County Jail, and the New York Jail. And they don't even provide treatment. Uh, so again, that's part of the, the stigma. And people who say, well, we're protecting their rights. Yeah, I get that. You know, we don't want them bombed up in this asylum. That's not what we want. But we ought to just, instead of saying they have the right to be sick, which many of them say, well, if they want to be homeless, they can be homeless. Our bill emphasizes the right to be well. And we get that. And when we can convey that to people, that that's what the system is doing, that's where you break down a lot of that stigma. Well, I know it's 
um, a, a bit controversial, this compassionate communication issue that is in this bill and opening up the line of communication between providers and family members is huge. So many family members have wanted to be a part of working with a provider to get their family member help and they, if the, the patient, if the, or maybe they're not even a patient yet, but if the mentally ill person doesn't want the help, they haven't had to get the help. And yet family all around them sees them crashing, sees them going off the deep end, and they've not been able to do anything. And there's something wrong with our system when our, the, you know, the mental health providers can't work with the family member. And so I think that is such a huge, um, a huge issue. But I will tell you that patient, and in the listening sessions I've held, patient advocacy groups are very nervous about it. And they are pushing back a bit, but I hope we are, a, we are able through a lot of communication with them and ensuring them that we do obviously want to protect the rights of those who are ill, but yet when the Ill, Ill folks don't even appreciate or understand they're ill, there has to be a way forward, and that's what I hope this bill does. Yeah, I would just refer you to the testimony of the state senator from Virginia that, that testified in front of our committee. If you want to know how big this issue is, you can find it on YouTube, but uh, his testimony is heartbreaking. Yeah, uh, Congressman, have you has this bill been scored by CBO yet, or is that We're waiting for the CBO score? Uh, and probably it will move through uh, health subcommittee, hopefully, and, and we'll get some things. We know that some of the issues, such as the same day doctor rule or hospital beds, going to cost. We got to find some offsets. The grant programs in there, we think we already have the offsets for those. What CBO does not score is those numbers I start off with: eighty-seven thousand deaths. They don't score that. 1.2 million suicide attempts, they don't score that. They don't score how much this costs the medical system of their chronic illnesses. It is in multi, multi billions. So we've got to find a way. We'll just keep working. Yeah, I mean, with the, you said $130 billion and how many programs? That's how much money we spend, 112 programs. $130 billion, the predominant part of that is disability payments with no requirement that the person gets treatment. Uh, and you know this bill that just passed budget bill does have something in there that people are disabled they have to be evaluated by, by a physician or something so we want to work with. Yes. Thank you for your work you're doing. Um, having worked in a safety net system in Philadelphia, we saw a lot of mental health. Um, emergency departments have often been the place we saw most of them present. One of the challenges I saw when working was that the wait times to get an appointment for mental health were 45 to 60 days, whether it be a uh, public program in the city or even in a, in a private facility. So, and then there just weren't enough doctors, not, not enough uh, psychologists, psychiatrists to do the work. We didn't have enough behavioral health. So is there something there to draw more folks into the field, deal with the residency issue, or how do we get them? So uh, actually, uh, those would be short wait times. Uh, given that what we heard from NIMH, National Institute of Mental Health, the average amount of time between first symptoms appearing and first treatment is 110 weeks. Now, that's not just waiting, but that's just people aren't aware, things go on, and then, then once uh, someone says we're trying to get an appointment, it is very difficult because we don't have enough providers, and of the providers we have, not enough of them specialize in serious mental illness. So what we have in here is a report that the, the we want the Assistant Secretary to bring back to our committee <coughs> and say this is the plan to get more providers in these fields. At some point in the future, whether it will be something like um, loan forgiveness or some other incentives in there, we do have a part in this that is uh, adding to, uh, uh, to the fellowship program minorities. Uh, we know that telepsychiatry, telepsychology will help a great deal uh, to, for those quick consults around the country. Uh, so those will help, but that, that is an urgent, urgent matter. What we don't have right now is the money to say, let's just have these loan forgiveness programs. We need a more comprehensive evaluation because we don't have that data. I mean, people have not been collecting this, so we don't know what to do. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to make a quick comment about the VA system on that also is an issue, you know, as you know, uh, the VA is behind by 130 or so psychiatrists to make a different number, approximately. So uh, a couple of years ago or a year ago, we uh, had legislation to allow, within the VA's own budget, more in, uh, loan repayment for psychiatrists if they came and worked for the VA. Uh, my proposal was $60,000 a year for every year that they served. And that sounds like a lot of money, but if you're a medical student with 200 and some thousand dollars of debt, it isn't. 
Uh, and, and in the final, I think, VA bill, I can't remember the number, but it was about, we, it was approved to, to increase that number from what they would normally do to help recruit psychiatrists into the VA, which is, as you know, right now, veterans are a big issue on the, on the, with PTSD and suicide issue. In some ways, the stigma surrounding mental health, I think, probably also extends into the medical education field. When you only have three um, graduates coming out of our medical school, out of a class of over 300, I think it tells you something. I don't think that psychiatrists are valued enough in our medical professions, and we've got to do what we can to elevate the importance of their role. I'm really pleased Governor Pence in Indiana has appointed a psychiatrist to lead our um, FSSA, Family Social Services Administration. Um, and so it's great. Dr. Werner um, is one of the um, most noted psychiatrists in Indiana and Kentucky and in the Midwest. And he now, for the first time, um, we have a medical professional leading Indiana's um, Medicaid programs and a number of other programs. And so I think he's going to add, um, he adds a different voice in Indiana and is always now talking about issues in psychiatry and mental health. And I think it's helping. We've just got to continue to talk about it. Yeah, Congressman, uh, could you talk a little bit about how the um, court system should be adjusted or, or what models exist that should be promoted or put forward? For example, uh, uh, in the District of Columbia, you have the criminal system and the mental health system. In fact, there are two court systems set up parallel side by side. So the question then becomes, how do you take cases from one to the other? If someone is in the criminal system, how do you get transferred to the mental health system where that patient, that person can get the help that they need? So uh, DC is struggling with that. I don't know what your view is, is success or not, but is it a model? What are, what are other states doing? Yeah, there are some models. Now, there's uh, mental health courts are different things. In many cases, mental health court is someone who has committed a serious crime, but it looks like they're, the insanity is thing. You put them in there, so mental health court is actually going to push them into some other treatment systems there. Uh, but another part of that is they'll monitor someone who does have uh, a crime and uh, make sure they stay in treatment. The other model is something called assisted outpatient treatment. Uh, many states have this, actually 45 states and the District of Columbia, and it is this. For someone with a history of violence, uh, arrests, uh, some incarcerations, and mental illness, um, when they are not being treated, not doing well, it is a judge or the, some other person who works in the judicial system which will say, we're going to order you to stay in outpatient treatment. It makes a world of difference. Duke University did a study on this in New York State along with the Virginia Law Center. And the reported results was over 80% reduction in incarceration, over 70% reduction in homelessness, over 70% reduction in emergency room visits, over 90% in patient and consumer satisfaction, and costs were cut by 50%. Now that being the case, some people said, wait a minute, you lost me when we said involuntary outpatient commitment. And they don't want that. Now I have trouble with that. Because I this is not someone who just says, okay, well, you're mentally we're going to force you into treatment. That's not that. Notice what I said, history of violence, incarceration, mental illness. And when they're not in treatment, they decompensate there. People who could have been identified to that nearby was the Navy Yard shooter, had that kind of history. You look at some of those other people over the summer that had these problems, we could have helped them if they were in a program like that. Um, uh, the, uh, but what, what happens is, when someone says to me, and sometimes this happens among some of the advocacy groups, is that we should never have any involuntary commitment because you should always try and work with the person. I agree. I practiced 40 years. I have never involuntarily committed someone, but I've worked with patients who have been involuntarily committed because sometimes you have to do that. And I raised this question with them. Do you think Adam Lanza should have been involuntarily committed? Do you think Jared Lochner should have been involuntarily committed? Uh, just run down the list of them. And if the person says no to all those, then I say, then this discussion is over. I have nowhere else to go. Because while they're focused on that, the Adam Lanza's rights to say no, where are the rights of all those children at Sandra Elementary School that are now dead? And that's the point that we have to be able to stand up as members of Congress and courageously talk about that. We, we do not want to have a system back like in the 50s and 60s where, uh, you know, some, you know, some place they thought there was a silence where a gulag. We don't want that. We're not going to have that again. But by golly, I believe that by having compassionate communication and some of those other options instead of jail, 
are far better to treat someone help to get better than what's been happening. So I hope we don't have to have another incident to get your full house. There will be another incident that may be happening as we speak. There will be another one. Um, a couple happen, a few happen every day, usually one or two at a time, but there will be some more.